All right, so it started the semester. Everyone's a little rusty or whatever. I, uh, I forgot to give an assignment <laughs> uh, for Tuesday. But here's the assignment for today. Um, Um, read through the vector review. Um, and uh, do the vector problems. And uh, these are going to be turned in on that first day that's listed for an assignment. Um, I think it's uh, September 8th or something. Okay, so this is just going to be stapled into the packet of problems that you turn in on September 8th. Um, <coughs> and also, uh, I don't really want to keep writing and typing this over and over again, but every day uh, part of the assignment, the first part of the assignment is whatever I say in class, go back through your notes, reread it. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. Um, one, two. Um, so read through the notes and work through any example problems. Um, I've been, I've sort of noticed, you know, I've taught this class for a lot of years, but just in the last, like, year, it's kind of hit me that uh, one of the, the most important hurdle in this class, the thing that, that stops people dead more than anything else, I think, is just comfort with... Uh, identifying the coordinates of points and coordinate systems and coming up with vectors going from one point to another point. And uh, so some of, these, some of these things that I talk about in this vector review, um, if you have trouble with that, there's, there's nothing, like you're kind of stuck on every other thing we do in this class. So you need to understand this vector stuff well. Okay. All right, so where were we? Um, Last time we were uh, we're on vector multiplication, we're, so we're still. I'm just talking about this vector review a little bit. Um, and vector multiplication, we had uh, two ways to multiply vectors. The first is the dot product. Um, and the dot product has two vectors as input and one scalar as output. And then the second one is the cross product. Um, that has two vectors as input and one vector as output. Um, so uh, people also sometimes call the dot product the scalar product and call the cross product the vector product because of what those outputs are. Okay, so uh, first of all, the dot product. Um, so if you have two vectors with components A, B, C, and you're dotting it with a vector uh, D, E, F, then the scalar output for that is equal to 
AD plus BE plus CF. Um, intuitively, we're not going to use this calculation at all, but as a way to sort of understand what's going on here. Um, so let's think about, sorry, uh, think about doing the dot product of a vector u and a vector v, okay? Put them tail to tail. So if that's the vector u, And that's the vector v. Here they're tail to tail. There are two angles from one to the other one, a short one and a long one. If you call the, the shortest distance from one to the other one the angle theta, then u dot v is equal to the length of u times the length of v times the cosine of that angle theta. Um, so that means uh, the dot product is bigger when those two are closer to being in the same direction, okay? Um, and because of that, the dot product is sometimes called the inner product. because in a way it's a measure of how close to in the same direction those two vectors are. On a TI calculator, uh, a lot of them have the dot product built in. If yours doesn't have it built in, um, we should write a program to do it. Um, actually, dot product we're not going to use as much this in this class as cross product, but it can't hurt to have it in your calculator. So come talk to me if you don't have a built-in function and uh, we can figure out a way to enter it into your calculator. But on a PI-89, that's what I have, so that's the one I know the best. Um, if you have, um, so if you have a vector um, one, two, three, that's how you enter a vector. So it's the x component, semicolon, y component, semicolon, z component. And then use the store function to put that in the variable name a or whatever variable you want. And then say we have a second vector, four, five, six. We'll store that in the variable name b. And then the built-in function is called dot p. I think it's all lowercase and then uppercase p. And if you do dot p a d, um, it gives you the answer, which is in this case 32, I think. Okay. So... As far as remembering this formula, uh, thinking about it in terms of this formula, you had or will have to do that in a math class. Here, really, the only things that you need to know is how to, how to do it on your calculator and intuitively what, what it's calculating. Okay. Um, on a TI-86, maybe on an 84, I don't remember if it's 
if 84s had this built-in function. Whoops. So on an 86, you just enter the vectors a little differently. Um, instead of using the semicolons to go between values, you go a square bracket to start the vector and then square brackets for every column of a matrix. So um, it'll be 1, 2, 3, like that. Store that in A. And then 4, 5, 6, store that in B. Um, and then the function's called the same thing, dot P of A and B. Better give the same thing. Yep. So, uh, yeah, when would you use it? Uh, um, one thing you can use it for is to get vector components. Um, if you have, so like if you have, if you're trying to transform from one coordinate system to another one, then say that you have the components of your new coordinate axes represented in your old coordinate system. Okay, so... Um, they would these new coordinate axes would all be unit vectors with components in your old one. And to get the components in the new coordinate system, you could take the dot product of the... Um, because in a way what it is is a projection um, onto a... a projection of one vector onto another vector. So that's one example. Um, you can also do it as a, as a check on uh, whether two vectors are perpendicular, because if you look at what this formula means, um, where's that intuitive one? Uh, when two vectors are 90 degrees from each other, the cosine is equal to zero. So um, if you're trying to find a vector that's perpendicular to another vector, you can, you can require that the dot products are equal to zero, you know, okay. that kind of thing. Um, okay, so a couple things to notice about the dot product. Um, the first one is the one I just said. Uh, the dot product of two perpendicular vectors is equal to zero. That's a fact about the dot product that you, you know, if you if you go into certain areas, you'll use that all the time to find vectors that you're looking for. Um, then the second thing is that in dot product, the order doesn't matter. So if you have a vector a and you're taking the dot product with the vector B, that's the same thing as B dotted with A. That makes sense. I mean, you're used to that because that's how multiplication works. But we're going to see with the cross product that's not true. The order does matter for the cross product. Any other questions about dot product? Okay, so now cross. We'll use this one a lot more. So if you have a vector A, B, C, and you're taking the cross product with D, E, F, um, 
the first component, so the output is going to be a vector, and the first component of that output vector is BF minus CE. The second component is negative quantity AF minus CD. And the third component is um, AE minus BD. And uh, I think you've probably all learned different ways to remember that formula, and you can feel free to use whichever one. Again, for us, uh, you don't have to remember anything. Just make sure it's in your calculator, and, uh, and I'll give you sort of an intuitive, uh, again, description of what it means. And those are the only two things you need to know. But this formula always works. Um, Notice the negative sign in front of the y component of the output. Uh, that's a that's a um, property, a thing that comes up all the time with right-handed coordinate systems, and uh, all we're ever going to use is right-handed coordinate systems. Um, the y the y component always behaves kind of like the other ones, but kind of weird. Like there's always negative signs thrown in with the y component, so. Um, don't forget that if you, when you do this by hand. Uh, in TI calculators, um, let's say we have a vector 1, 0, zero, so that's the x-axis, and we'll store that in a uh, vector in variable a. And then the second one is zero, one, zero. We'll store that in vector b. And then if you take the cross product that uh, Again, is lowercase cross and then uppercase P of A and B. It gives you the um, vector 0, 0, 1. Uh, this, this is the notation for a TI-89. For an 86, you just use that different notation for the um, for the vectors. So you'd have to do one zero zero with with each one of those in its own square bracket. Then zero one zero, and then it's the same cross product function. Intuitively, so again, uh, since your calculators do the cross product for you, really this is the this is the important thing to remember. Um, to take the cross product of u and v. Um, Put the vectors tail to tail. And so if this is your vector u and this is your vector v, again, there's a longer angle that's over 180, and there's a, another angle that's uh, less than 180, you know, up to 180. We only care about the shorter angle. And U cross V is equal to the magnitude of U 
times the magnitude of V times the sine of that angle theta. And now this isn't enough for the cross product because the cross product is a vector. We need a direction too. Um, and the direction follows the right hand rule. Okay, so the right hand rule says um, take the starting vector, like orient your fingers with the starting vector. That's the U, the first one. And then rotate your fingers. Uh, hold your hand in a position where your fingers can rotate from U to V. Okay? You might think like, well, I'm double jointed or whatever, so I can. Pretend your hand only goes this way. Okay. So get your hand in a position where you can rotate your fingers from U to V. Then your thumb is pointing in the direction of the vector. So in this case, uh, the cross product would be into the page. Question? So when you have a cross product that's in the hex y axis, it always points to V? That's right. And actually, uh, that's a property of, so using the right hand rule, you can find cross product definitions or a cross product definition of a right handed coordinate system. CS for coordinate system. Uh, a right hand coordinate system, the, the ones that we use, the ones that we're always going to use, uh, say the x axis crossed with the y axis always has to give you the z axis. So i cross j is equal to k. i cross k has to give you negative j, that's that, the y-axis being difficult again. And then uh, j cross k is equal to i. And you can think those through in terms of the right-hand rule, you know, like if if this is our coordinate system, So there's the y-axis is up, the z-axis is that way. Okay, so rotate, erase that. <coughs> That's a, that made it really unnecessarily hard to do this right-hand rule. I'm going to break my arm. Okay, so let's do, uh, so x-axis that way, y-axis up, and then the Z axis is coming out towards us. Have you seen that symbol before where a vector coming out of the page is like a point, a vector going into the page is like an X, like the. Okay, so I cross J is equal to K. So that first one holds. I cross K, start there, go that way, is equal to negative J, so that one holds. Uh, J cross K is equal to I, so that one holds. So that's a right-handed coordinate system. Um, any questions about the right-hand rule? All right, so here are the things to remember about cross product. Um, first, the cross product of any two parallel vectors has to be equal to zero. So, 
It's the zero vector. And you can see that from this formula. Uh, we have a sine of the angle between the vectors in this formula. So uh, when, when vectors have an angle of zero or 180 degrees from each other, the sine is zero. So, um, so that cross product has to be equal to zero. And then the second thing is for cross product, the order does matter. And that's, we're not used to that with multiplication related things. Uh, multiplication of numbers, the order doesn't matter. Dot product order doesn't matter, but here it does. Um, so if you take the cross product of A and B, that's equal to the negative of the cross product of B and A. And it makes sense if you think about it in terms of the right-hand rule. Um, so um, I cross J is a vector coming out. J cross I is a vector going in. Yep. So the inverse of the cross I A and B is the negative of the quantity B cross A? Uh, that that I can can move in and out uh, of whatever vector you can think of that as the negative of the whole cross product or you can think of it as negative B cross quantity negative B cross a or you can think of it as B cross negative quantity negative a you know what I mean okay. it's all the same um, Okay, any questions about that? Okay, now this is a thing, uh, when I was saying at the start that I've been noticing recently how, how much the rest of the class for students hinges on, this, on these first things. This is the thing that seems to come up as a pitfall sometimes. So um, the next thing we need to talk about is how to calculate the vector from a point A to a point B. And uh, a lot of times I'll say that is 2B from A because that's kind of more in line with the way the equation looks. Um, there are two ways to do this. First, if you know the coordinates of the two points, then the vector 2B from A is just the coordinates of B minus the coordinates of A. So for example, um, you know, if you have So let's say this is our coordinate system. And we have the point, um, let's say the point A is 1, 1. Those are the coordinates. And let's say the point B is 0, negative 2. Then the vector going to B from A is this. We're trying to calculate the components of this vector. And you would just do that as 0, negative 2, minus 1, 1. So negative 1, negative 3.
And if you eyeball that vector, do those do the signs of those components make sense? Or yeah, um, it's definitely pointing in the into the third quadrant if you think of the origin being at the tail of the vector. So those components make sense, you know, you're, or you can think of it as like you're going down three and then in the negative x direction, one. Okay, so this is, that's how you do it if you know the coordinates of the two points. Um, you can also do it like this. Um, you can think of the origin at the starting point That's A for us in this example. Um, and then the coordinates of the ending point um, are the components of the vector. The ending point B are the components of the vector to B from A. So here's a pretty typical way that we would need to uh, use something like this in this class. Um, so let's say that we have a big bar um, that's connected to the ground by like a hinge at the bottom and it's leaning against a wall. And let's say the length of the bar is half a meter. And let's say the angle between the bar and the ground is 30 degrees. So let's say the pin is the point A and the contact point with the ground is the point B. Um, What's the vector to be from A? Well, you can think of the coordinate system as being at the starting point. And then just calculate the coordinates of the point B. So you can think of that as um, the length of the vector, point 0.5 times the cosine of, like, if you're going from the positive x-axis, you can do this. I mean, if you're comfortable doing this in a different way, do it, do it however you're comfortable. But you can think of starting at the positive x-axis, and now we're trying to um, we're trying to figure out the angle from the positive x-axis counterclockwise to here. So you can think of going like 180 to there, and then backtracking 30, so 150. So 0.5 times the cosine of 150, sine of 150, and uh, that gives you uh, 0.433, that's negative, and then positive 0.25. So putting the coordinate system at the starting point, the coordinates of B are this, and so that's also the components of the vector, 
the, comp the vector that we want is this. Um, you could do that if you then think about what quadrant it's in and deal with the signs, you know, the signs yourself. But if you think about, if you, you can just let the signs work out for themselves if you always just go from the positive x-axis to the vector. Okay, so that's how I tend to do it. But, but yeah, you could do it, you could say, okay, this, this length is 0.433 and it's in the second quadrant, so it's going to be negative. Um, any questions about that? Okay, this sort of goes along with um, calculating unit vectors in known directions. A unit vector is just a vector with a length of one. And unit vectors are useful because you can break up any vector into, um, so it's useful because um, any vector u can be expressed as, so this vector u is equal to the magnitude of the vector u times a unit vector in the direction of u. That's what the hat means, unit vector. And now we have this expression where this is a pure length. Pure magnitude, and this unit vector is used as a pure direction. So we can separate the, the magnitude out from the direction. <coughs> and the reason that's useful is um, in a lot of cases, we'll know the direction of a force, but we won't know the magnitude. And so this will let us uh, use the information we know and reduce the number of. Um, use the information we know and, uh, and then calculate only the, the information that we don't know. Okay, we're going to use this idea all the time. An example of that is, is like a cable tension. Um, from, the, from the direction that the cable's sitting, you know the direction of the force the cable's applying to something. And so you can represent that as a unit vector and then all you have left to calculate is the magnitude instead of having to calculate both components of a force vector. Um, there are two ways to calculate a unit vector. Um, The first one is um, if you're given an angle between um, the desired vector and some 
uh, some reference. This we're only going to do in 2D problems. Uh, this becomes really tedious in 3D, and, and there's just no reason to mess with it. So you can think of this approach as for 2D only. And then the second approach is um, if you're given the coordinates of the start and end point of the vector. Um, you can use this in 2D and 3D. Okay, so let me go through examples of each of these. So first, if you're given the angle between the vector and some reference, First, you're going to find the counterclockwise angle from the positive x-axis to the vector. Um, in order for this to make sense, you have to have the tail of the vector at the origin. Then the unit vector in that direction is cosine theta, sine theta. And the plus minus signs will work out for themselves. So you can think of that's u hat. Uh, so let's do an example. Um, so let's say that we have a coordinate system like this. There's the positive x-axis. There's the positive y-axis. And uh, say that we, the vector we want makes an angle of 20 degrees with the negative y-axis. And we want to calculate the components of that unit vector. Well, we need to calculate the counterclockwise angle from the positive x-axis to this. So you can think of that as being, I already, I put the tail at the origin, so that part's done. Uh, go around here, that's 180. Another 90 is 270. And then backtrack 20. Okay, so the angle is 250 on that one. And so you'd use cosine and sine of 250. You could also go clockwise and call it a negative angle, so then it would be negative 90, negative another 20, so negative 110 would give you the same answers. So u is equal to cosine of um, 250, sine of 250, which is the same thing as cosine of negative 110, sine of negative 110. And uh, that should be negative 
negative 0 0.940. What would you get if you calculated the magnitude of this vector? One. Yep. Right. So if you use the Pythagorean theorem, calculate the magnitude of a unit vector, you'd always get one. That's the idea. Um, so now the second type. is where you're given the um, given the coordinates of a vector's start and end point um, and uh, you want to find a unit vector in that direction. Okay, so the steps for this are, um, let's say that the start, the start point we'll call A again. The end point we'll call B again. So the first step is calculate the vector that goes from A to B. And that you do that as the coordinates B minus the coordinates A. The second step is to calculate the magnitude of that. Um, so the magnitude of U remember, is equal to ux squared plus uy squared, all square root. And let me, actually, let me extend that to 3d. This works in 2 or 3d. And then the unit vector, the thing that we want, is equal to 1 over the length times the original vector. So think about how that works for a second because it, it makes good intuitive sense. If you, have, if you have a vector that's in the direction you want, but it has a magnitude of 50, what you want to do to have a vector with a length of 1 in that same direction is just divide all the components of that vector by 50, you know. So you calculate the length, you get an answer of 50, divide by 50, and you get something with a length of 1 that's in the original direction. Okay. Um, so let's do an example. Um, a lot of times, uh, one place where these come up all the time is in cable problems. So let's say that you have a beam that's connected by a hinge, a pin joint, to the wall. And then at this end, it's supported by a cable. Let's call um, the point connected to the beam, A, the point connected to the wall, B. And let's say A is equal to uh, 5, negative 4. And B is equal to um, 7, uh, negative 3. And we want to calculate the unit vector in the direction 2B from A.
So the first thing we have to do is calculate the vector that goes to B from A. Um, so that vector is just equal to 7, negative 3, minus 5, negative 4, And so you get a vector 2, 1. Then the next, oops, I, this notation is wrong. I wrote that as a, uh, as a magnitude. The first thing we're doing is just calculating that, that vector u. Okay. And then the next step is calculating the magnitude of that. Um, so the magnitude of u is 2 squared plus 1 squared. Oh, by the way, if your calculator has dot product and um, has dot product and cross product in it, uh, it also has a function called unit vector, unit v, and you can do it the same way. So you don't have to remember this formula. The smarter your calculator is, the less smart you have to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We want, to, we want to take as much difficulty out as possible. Um, so square root of 5 is the magnitude. And so then the unit vector in that direction is 1 over square root of 5 times the original vector of 2, 1. And that's 2 times root 5. I actually prefer decimals, but I don't know what the decimals are here, so I'll, I'll just leave it like this. So that's a unit vector in the direction of a vector going from A to B. So this is the vector U. And then the unit vector is pointed in that same direction, but just not as long. Um, okay, I have a problem for you to try to think through, and then I'll go through it. Um, this is, uh, this sort of uses, it's the kind of thing that's going to be really helpful in this class. Um, so let me, let me just draw the problem out, and then, so let's say that we have a wall that's at an angle of 60 degrees. with the horizontal. And then the vector that we want makes an angle of 15 degrees um, with that wall. And we're going to use just a, like a standard horizontal vertical coordinate system. What are the components of this unit vector? Um, well, the idea is you're just going to keep, you're going to start at the positive x-axis, and then you're, and you need to uh, have the vector at the origin of the coordinate system. And then you're just going to keep going clockwise, clockwise, and counterclockwise from one known thing, the positive x-axis, to the next thing you know, and then go from that to the next thing you know. Some problems you'll have to do it a few times, you know, bouncing back and forth until you end up at the, at the angle between the vector you want and the positive x-axis. So see if you can think that through. If you can't, it's not a big deal, but I, I, I want to kind of... Um, give a demonstration of how to do something like this that you have to do in steps. 
now that you've had a little time to think about it. Uh, so first thing we want to do is put the, think of the um, tail of the vector being at the origin of the coordinate system. So I'll just draw the coordinate system over here. There's x, there's y. Um, and the first thing we know is we know that it's positive 60 degrees to get from to get from the positive x-axis to a vector going this way. Okay. The next thing we know is that it is 180 degrees to get from this vector to this vector. Okay. Those are both counterclockwise. And then the last thing we know is that it's 15 degrees clockwise to get from the blue vector to, so I'll write that as negative 15 degrees because it's clockwise. And so the angle from the positive x-axis to the vector we want is 60 plus 180 minus 15. So 240, what's that, 225? And um, so the unit vector then is just cosine of 225, sine of 225, which is uh, negative 0.7071, negative 0.7071. Seventy, subtract 75 from, okay, so, so yeah, you could, so go around here and you get to 270, right. but then to me it's not, um, I suppose if you, you could recognize then that since what you have here is a right triangle, that this angle is 30, you know, so you could go 270 to here, minus 30 to that blue line, and then minus another 15, that's one way you can do it. But you have to remember that um, all of these vectors' tails have to be at the origin. So I think that's, so if you're thinking of this being an angle of 75, that's where you're, that's where you're going wrong is that um, you're looking at, like that would be, that would be true thinking of this vector with the head at the origin, but if you put this vector's tail at the origin, the one with the 60 degrees, it has to be off that way, okay? So just be sure that each one of these intermediate steps along the way, you have the tail of that vector at the origin. Okay. Um, you'll do a lot of problems like this and it, it'll become clear as you go, but yep. I don't see that. There are always um, there are always many ways to do these, you know, just depending on what relationships you see. Um, so it's not like you, the way I said it is the only way to do it, but um, but basically you're just you're just trying to hop from one relationship that you know to the next relationship that you know piggyback until you get to that final destination. Any other questions about that? I sort of meant that just to be kind of a first 
glimpse at this way of thinking about these angles. Um, all right. Uh, so that's the end of the kind of mathematical preliminaries. Uh, and now we can start talking about statics. Um, and the first thing we're going to talk about is statics of particles. And so we have to know what a particle is. A particle is an object with mass. Um, but no, but let's say treated as having no length dimensions. Because it doesn't have any length dimensions, we don't make any distinctions between the different orientations of the object, so we don't care if it's spinning or not, okay? Um, so therefore, we don't care about its orientation. And since we don't care about the orientation, that's going to cut down on the number of equations that we have to use. I mean, in a good way, but there's just less we have to care about. So we're not going to use the moment equation, the rotational version of Newton's second law. We're just going to use Newton's second law with particles. Um, so what is a particle? You know, like is a <laughs> that's a really weird combination of words. Uh, notice. Um, what is a particle? You know, like, is a, okay, like a neutrino is a particle. What about a whole atom? Is that a particle? You know, what about, like, an eraser? What about, like, a fish? What about, you know, um, an island? All these things, like, um, at what point do we stop calling them particles and start calling them rigid bodies? Well, the answer is they are all of them are particles, including planets, you know, um, planetary motion, you treat planets as particles, as long as you don't care about the orientation, okay? Um, you can treat anything as a particle. as long as you don't care about its orientation. Now, there's one little issue here. Uh, where do you, so think about a, a planet. Uh, you're treating a, a planet as a particle but there's thousands of miles in any direction where you could where you could say this is what I'm going to call that object's location. Okay, so you can treat anything as a particle as long as you consider the object's location to be its center of mass. So. Uh, Call the objects center of mass, C O M, center of mass, the location of the object. Um, 
the only um, will only use Newton's second law for particles. Not the moment equation, the one that I call RN2L, rotational Newton's second law. And Newton's second law says add up all the external forces on a body. F net is equal to the mass of the chosen body times the acceleration of the center of mass. That gives you two equations in 2D and three equations in 3D. And the number of equations is always going to be an important consideration in this class. Uh, we're always going to be real, real aware of this as we get into this class because um, we're always trying to solve for some number of variables. And you can only solve for the number of variables that you have that number of equations for. Okay. So uh, once we get, you know, we're starting out with sort of simple problems, but uh, once we get going, we're going to always be counting out the equations we have really carefully. Um, in statics, um, objects are always in equilibrium. So the acceleration of the center of mass is a zero vector. So for us, in this class, Newton's second law says add up all the external forces on the body. It's equal to the zero vector. So this is Newton's second law for statics. Um, one of the big, so I mentioned when I was giving sort of like an overview of what this class is about, um, I mentioned that since we're throwing out all the information that goes on the right side of Newton's second law. This class is really just an exercise in getting good habits about dealing with the left side of Newton's second law. And uh, one of the most important parts of good habits is doing good free body diagrams. So anytime we use Newton's second law or rotational Newton's second law, uh, we have to have a free body diagram. Anytime we use Newton's second law or the moment equation that's coming up next, must have a free body diagram. And uh, I'll always take off points for not having a free body diagram. Always. Till the day I die, and possibly after. Um, so, I guess let's stop there for today, and uh, I'll start on Tuesday um, by going through a careful list of requirements for free body diagrams. <laughs>